Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today, we're going to be talking about a J-pop related true crime case. Now, I know I've got a series on my channel called K-pop Crime Time and Controversies, but there are actually also a lot of crazy stories in J-pop, probably even more than in K-pop to be honest. So if you guys can think of like a more inclusive name for the series, then let me know in the comments. Anyways, in this video, we're going to be talking about one of the most prolific celebrity stalkers in Japan, Tomohiro Iwazaki. Now, Tomohiro was a pretty unhinged and obsessed individual who had a long track record of stalking and harassing female celebrities. But despite receiving numerous complaints from different celebrities about his creepy behavior, police did absolutely nothing to stop Tomohiro or protect the victims because they simply didn't think that stalking was a serious threat. That was until Tomohiro ended up brutally stabbing one of these victims, an idol by the name of Mayu Tamita. This case honestly gets my blood boiling and I'm pretty sure you guys are going to be just as annoyed as me by the time you're done with this video. But <laughs> before I start getting like super frustrated, um, we should probably introduce the sponsor for today's video, SeatGeek. SeatGeek is the fastest and smartest way to purchase tickets for live events. And ever since I've discovered this app, I've never gone back. So let me show you how it works. The app contains tickets for every sort of event you can think of, from comedy shows to sports games to music festivals. But one event that I'm really looking forward to is the Monster X concert, which is going to be taking place later this month. So let's just click into that. And as you can see, SeatGeek has already compiled all the tickets from across the internet all in one place. And they even analyze all of these tickets for you, using red and green dots to indicate whether you're getting a good deal, which just makes the entire ticket purchasing process so much simpler and faster. And if all of that isn't already awesome enough, SeatGeek is also offering all of you viewers a $20 discount on your first ticket purchase. So all you have to do is download SeatGeek, which I'll be linking the description and then use code PLUPY at checkout. Huge thanks once again to SeatGeek for sponsoring this video and without further ado, let's jump right into today's story. Tomohiro Iwasaki was born in 1988 to a middle-class family in the city of Isasaki. He was actually the youngest of three children, and from what I can tell, he seemed to have a relatively normal childhood. His teachers and classmates described him as being a quiet and polite child who didn't cause much trouble, and he apparently also did pretty well at school. But where his true passions lay was actually in the sport of judo. You see, Tomohiro had always dreamt of becoming an Olympic judo athlete, and so he reportedly spent hours practicing every day after school. And he eventually got so good at it that he won several national tournaments. And at one point, he allegedly even competed against the current reigning world champion, Ryonosuke Haga. Because of his athletic accomplishments, he eventually received a full scholarship to one of the top sports schools in Japan. But sadly, this was when his life started to take a downward turn. Tomohiro suddenly began withdrawing from his friends and family. Now, obviously he had always been a quiet person, but he was now going almost completely silent for days on end. And because of this, he unsurprisingly struggled to make any friends at his new high school. The problem became so bad that he actually had to drop out after just a few months. He then tried to re-enroll in another high school, but he faced the same problems and had to drop out once again. But perhaps even more worryingly, it was also around this time that Tomohiro completely gave up on his lifelong dreams of becoming a judo athlete. Instead, he abruptly moved to Kyoto all by himself and started taking up part-time jobs in the landscaping industry, which was something that he had never expressed interest in before. Tomohiro's family now looks back at this and they suspect that he might have actually had undiagnosed depression. His older brother mentioned that Tomohiro was someone who was just really bad at communicating his emotions and difficulties. And it's possible that when he started feeling depressed, he just shut down and retreated further and further into his own world. 
world. His one and only outlet seemed to be his blog, where he regularly wrote about his dark thoughts, saying things like, I loved humans too much, I expected too much, and what's the meaning of living? As Tomohiro continued to become more and more isolated, he realized that he did crave social interactions, but simply didn't know how to make personal connections with others. And so this was when he began to turn to the J-pop industry to fill his void. As you guys probably know, many Japanese celebrities interact with their fans through handshake events, live streams, fan meets, etc. And this is usually a great way for celebrities and fans to get to know each other a little bit better. But occasionally, it can also cause certain fans to think that they actually have some sort of personal relationship with the celebrity. And that was exactly what happened with Tomohiro. I mean, these interactions finally made him feel accepted and validated for one which caused him to eventually develop an infatuation with many of these female celebrities. He would spend hours obsessing over their every move and would post incessantly about them on his blogs. And he even began stalking some of these artists, sending them unwanted gifts and love messages, only to then get offended when they didn't reciprocate his feelings. In 2013, an idol actually made a report to the police stating that Tomohiro had been sending her death threats. The police reportedly called Tomohiro into the station, but when he failed to show up, they just completely gave up and dropped the entire case. And then in 2015, another idol also filed a complaint against Tomohiro after she spotted him following her around. But once again, the police just kind of swept the issue under the rug and no further action was taken. Interestingly, he eventually stopped supporting, or rather should I say stalking, most of these female celebrities after they committed actions that he considered impure. Tomohiro was obsessed with the idea of purity, and even though he himself often objectified and sexualized female celebrities on his blog, he hated it when they actually embraced their own sexualities. One example of this would be actress Ai Hashimoto. Tomohiro had actually been a fan of Ai for over three years, but when Ai admitted that she enjoyed watching porn, Tomohiro became outraged, and he made a blog post stating that he could no longer support her. He wrote, I knew that Ai Hashimoto had a perverted temperament for a long time, but when I saw an article that she was addicted to romantic pornography, I was really turned off. He also bashed AKB48 member Rino Sashihara after she was embroiled in a dating scandal, and he even made a blog post stating that any woman who appeared in porn should just commit suicide. What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? You would think that surely someone with such high moral standards would hold themselves to those very same principles, right? Well, no, because guess who starred in a poor video? That's right, Tomohiro did. Now, when I first saw this, I was wondering, and you're probably wondering as well, how does someone as awkward as Tomohiro become a poor? Star. Well, it turns out that the video he appeared in was actually called Yu Hatano and the Real Amateurs Get It On. And as the name implies, the entire premise of this video is that all of these men are supposed to be amateur virgins who have never had any relationship experience with women. And they had actually volunteered to be in this film for free to basically get their first sexual experience. I mean, Japanese porn is just something else. But yeah, if it wasn't already obvious enough, this is just further confirmation that Tomohiro didn't have much experience with women, which might have also contributed to his stalking behavior. He actually wrote about this on his blog as well, claiming that he had been studying and reading up about love and had even registered for a dating site, but was still unable to meet anyone. And so at this point, Tomohiro was in his late 20s, and he was feeling very lonely. He desperately wanted to be in a relationship, Yet all the female celebrities he had approached had either ignored him or, worse yet, reported him to the police. This was when Tomohiro realized that perhaps he was aiming a little too high. After all, most of the women that he obsessed over were big name celebrities, who probably already had thousands of male fans vying for their attention. Tomohiro came to the realization that he probably needed to aim for women that were a bit more down to earth, a bit more attainable, I guess you could say. And so this was when he set his sights on the underground idol industry. 
For some context, underground idols are basically like less well-known idols who perform at small venues such as restaurants and conventions. And because they have such small fan bases, they typically interact a lot more with each of their fans. Tomohiro realized that this would be a great way for him to get closer to the idol, and he also figured that since these idols were less well known, they would probably be more appreciative of his support, and they might potentially give him the attention and affection he felt he so deserved. And so he began lurking around at these underground events and following less well known artists, and that was when a singer by the name of Mayu Tamita caught his eye. Mayu was born in October of 1995. She was known as a really bright and intelligent person, and at this point, she was actually studying business administration at Asia University, which is located in Tokyo. Her professors described her as an enthusiastic student who excelled in many areas, including her academics. But although Mayu seemed to have many strengths, her real passion was actually music. She really enjoyed singing, playing the guitar and composing, and had always dreamt of becoming a singer-songwriter. But unfortunately, the road to musical success isn't always easy, and even though Mayu wanted to become a singer, she actually had to make her debut back in 2010 as a model instead, when she appeared on rock band Galileo Galilei's album cover. Then in 2011, she became an actress and idol, starring as one of the main characters in a TV show called Secret Girls. This show was kind of similar to Hannah Montana, and it was about a group of girls who lived double lives as normal students whilst also being an idol group. This was really the closest that Mayu got to becoming a singer, and the fictional group actually went on to perform at several musical events. <laughs> But sadly, after the show ended, Mayu's career kind of died down, and aside from a few cameo roles, she pretty much had no work. So in 2015, she finally left her label to pursue her childhood dream of becoming a full-time singer-songwriter. She was obviously really excited about this, but at the same time, because she didn't have a label, it was really difficult for her music to go mainstream. She only had about 13,000 Twitter followers, and she became, I guess what you would call an under ground singer. But despite this, Mayu didn't give up, and she just worked even harder to promote herself wherever she could. She performed at various conventions and theatre productions, and she even joined Acolife, which was a band of independent musicians that performed in restaurants across Tokyo. And it was through all these events that Mayu made many friends in the music industry. And it was unfortunately also how Tomohiro ended up discovering her. It is unclear exactly which event Tomohiro first spotted Mayu at, but based on his online history, it seems like he became her fan sometime in early 2015. Initially, Tomohiro was able to, I guess you could say, disguise himself as like a normal fan. He liked and commented on Mayu's post just like anyone else, and he would also attend her events and bring her presents like flowers and sweets. However, Tomohiro wasn't able to hide his stalkerish ways for long, and as time went on, he started to exhibit more and more creepy behavior towards Mayu. He began expressing on his blogs that he wanted to marry Mayu and have babies with her, and he even started giving Mayu weird gifts like obscene books and magazines, which she reluctantly accepted. I suppose she was trying to be polite and appreciative of her fans, but this just gave Tomohiro the wrong idea, and he believed that because he had given Mayu so many gifts, he was now entitled to her love and affection. By the time the 17th of January 2016 rolled around, Tomohiro had become so delusional that he actually decided he was going to propose to her, and so he bought his most expensive gift yet, a luxury watch and a few books, and he headed over to the Italian Camerino restaurant, where Mayu and her group Echo Life were set to perform that night. After Mayu's performance, he handed her the gifts and reportedly attempted to propose to her. Mayu once again accepted the gifts and told Tomohiro that obviously she couldn't marry him, but she actually had a Twitter, and if he wanted, he could follow her there for more updates. 
Tomohiro was absolutely overjoyed by this. See, aside from his blog, he had never actually used Twitter or any other form of social media before. And because he was completely foreign to the concept of social media, he seemed to have completely misunderstood how it worked. During my research, it really seemed to me like he thought Twitter was some kind of exclusive platform where people had intimate and personal conversations. Kind of like WhatsApp, I suppose. So even though Mayu had rejected his marriage proposal, the fact that she told him to follow her on Twitter made Tomohiro feel like he had just been invited to join her exclusive circle. So the next day, he immediately set up his Twitter and followed Mayu. And he also followed Mayu's friend Riko Matsumara. Riko was actually a fellow musician from Echo Life, and Tomohiro had discovered her when she performed with Mayu at the restaurant the night before. He excitedly started tweeting at both women, fully expecting them to respond. And much to his delight, Rico actually replied and even followed him back. Rico clearly wasn't too familiar with Tomohiro at this point and had no idea about his stalkerish ways. However, the same couldn't be said about Mayu. Tomohiro had been Mayu's fan for over a year at this point, and his increasingly creepy behavior had honestly been bothering Mayu for quite some time. Mayu initially tried to ignore her gut feelings, but the marriage proposal was just a step too far for her. She reportedly confided in her friends about the situation, and even posted a cryptic tweet hinting at a quote, troublesome situation. Although Mayu was someone who had always prided herself on her close interaction with fans, she realized that she should probably distance herself from Tomohiro ASAP before he got even more obsessed. So she never followed him back, nor did she respond to any of his tweets. As the days dragged on and Tomohiro's tweets went unanswered, he began to grow impatient with Mayu. Did she not see his tweets? Was she too busy to respond? Tomohiro just couldn't understand why Mayu was seemingly ignoring him. And so he began writing things like, Your lack of response is an evil act. And affection can easily turn to hatred. I usually like Mayu. But things only got worse when on the 30th of January, Mayu and Rico posted photos of themselves hanging out together. And then coincidentally, the next day, Rico unfollowed Tomohiro and set her account to private. Tomohiro figured that this likely occurred because Mayu must have badmouthed him to Rico, which to be fair is probably true. I mean, if I was Mayu, I would probably want to look out for my friends and tell them about a potential stalker. But of course, this enraged Tomohiro. He began spamming both Riko and Mayu with tweets demanding to know why he had been unfollowed. He was particularly angry with Mayu. He couldn't believe that after all the money and time he had invested in her, she instead went behind his back and badmouthed him. In Tomohiro's mind, he believed Mayu had become ungrateful and big-headed, and his once intense love for Mayu soon turned to hate. He changed his Twitter username to the one who doesn't like you is crap. And he began spamming Mayu's Twitter and blog with over 400 hate messages a month, saying threatening comments such as, I will never forget how you looked down on me, and die, 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 die. Then on the 27th of April, he made yet another one of his awful tweets, this time implying that Mayu was greedy and ungrateful for accepting his gifts. It was all getting too much for Mayu, and she decided that enough was enough. Frankly, she didn't even want Tomohiro's gifts to begin with, and now that he was using them as leverage against her, she decided that she was just better off returning his gifts to him so that she no longer owed him anything. So the very next day, she mailed the luxury watch and several of the obscene books back to Tomohiro. But when Tomohiro received this package, he just became even angrier. He felt like Mayu had humiliated and rejected him by returning the gifts. And out of spite, he started demanding that Mayu return every single item he had ever given her, including the flowers, sweets, and other things from months ago. And he even commented this message on Mayu's post, which, unbeknownst to everyone, would actually turn out to be an eerie warning of events to come. Mayu finally ended up blocking Tomohiro that afternoon, but he refused to give up and began harassing one of Mayu's friends, a singer by the name of Yamagata Momoko, instead. He ruthlessly flooded poor Yamagata's Twitter with countless, and I mean countless, messages, demanding she tell Mayu to return all the remaining items. 
On April 29th, he wrote, Tell Mayu Tomita to return everything. Then May 1st, he was like, There are some things that still haven't been returned yet. Tell her to return them all. May 2nd, I haven't received my package yet. What is Mayu Tomita doing? May 3rd, return quickly. May 4th, return. May 6th, why is she not returning it? May 7th, it's already been a week. Why are my gifts not returned? I mean, he was just going on and on about his stupid gifts. And honestly, when I was reading this, I was starting to get pretty annoyed. I mean, he was acting like his gifts were the most precious thing in the world when, let's be real, I mean, who even wants his obscene magazines? Anyways, at this point, Mayu was obviously feeling terrified, and her family was also really worried about her safety. So on the 4th of May, her mother attempted to report Tomohiro to the Kyoto police station. She assumed that this would be the correct police station to report to, since Tomohiro was located in Kyoto. However, the Kyoto police said that they couldn't help her, and told her to report this incident to the Tokyo police instead, since Mayu was located in Tokyo. So, Mayu followed their instructions and made a report to the Tokyo Metropolitan Police on the 9th of May. And she even brought with her 71 printouts and 70 screenshots of Tomohiro's hateful Twitter messages. However, despite all the evidence, the police completely dismissed Mayu's concerns, claiming that it didn't fall under Japan's current anti-stalking laws. So I'm gonna have to go on a bit of a tangent here about Japan's anti-stalking laws, because it actually plays a very important role in this case, and it also goes to show how the outdated laws failed Mayu and so many other victims in Japan. Okay, so the anti-stalking law was first introduced in the 2000s because of a high-profile stalking murder case. The victim had made multiple reports to the police regarding her stalker following her around, but police at the time didn't think that following someone around constituted a physical threat, and so they basically dismissed the victim, resulting in her eventually getting murdered. Because of that, the anti-stalking law was introduced, making acts of physical stalking illegal. Fast forward to 2013 and another high-profile stalking murder case occurred. This time, the victim had attempted to seek help from the police after she had been harassed via email. However, because the anti-stalking laws at the time only included in-person physical stalking, the police didn't consider the email stalking a threat and they ignored her, and that resulted in her also getting murdered. As a result, Japan then added email harassment to their list of illegal stalking acts. So this all brings us back to Mayu's case. At this point, it's 2016, and the anti-stalking laws include in-person as well as email harassment. But this time, what Mayu was experiencing was social media harassment. And well, that wasn't included in the anti-stalking laws. So you guessed it, police didn't consider it a threat. Are you guys seeing a pattern here? It's almost like they didn't learn anything from all the past stalking cases. And furthermore, police even claimed that the tweets weren't considered threatening in the first place because Tomohiro never explicitly used the word kill. Note that Tomohiro actually did write the word die, but because it wasn't the word kill specifically, police didn't consider it a threat. Look, I get that the police need to have guidelines and policies, but the world also isn't black and white, and I just think it's pretty ridiculous and almost comical how the police and the law failed to account for any sort of nuance at all. And honestly, I can't even imagine how frustrating it must have all been for Mayu and her family. Anyways, as more time passed and no action was taken, the harassment obviously continued, and Mayu became more and more frightened. On the 19th of May, Mayu attempted to make yet another desperate plea to the police. She was actually set to perform at an event called Solid Girls Night Volume 11 just two days later, and she feared Tomohiro might show up. So she begged the police, like literally begged them, for extra security just in case. But once again, the police completely ignored her concerns, and they claimed that Tomohiro just needed some time to cool off and he was most likely going to get over his obsession before the day of the event. 
but of course they were wrong. Tomohiro's obsession with Mayu hadn't cooled off. If anything, his hatred for Mayu just seemed to escalate as the days passed, and by this point, he actually had become so unhinged that he wanted to kill her. So when he found out about the Solid Girls Night Volume 11 event, he obviously figured that this would be the perfect opportunity for him to execute his plans. And so he purchased an 8.2 centimeter pocket knife online and began planning his attack. Finally, the day of the event arrived. It was the 21st of May 2016, and that morning, Tomohiro grabbed his pocket knife and left home at around 7 a.m., traveling for over three hours to western Tokyo, where the event venue was located. He figured Mayu would probably be getting to the event venue by train, so he waited at the nearby train station for hours, all the while posting ominous messages on his blog saying things such as, it's usually shame, not motivation that drives people to do something. Finally, at around 5 p.m., Mayu arrived at the station. As soon as Tomohiro saw her, he began following her from a distance as she walked towards the event venue. Just as she was about to enter the building, Tomohiro then confronted her, demanding to know why she had returned his presence. Terrified, Mayu gave an ambiguous answer before quickly turning around and trying to leave. She then took out her phone from her pocket and desperately tried to call the police. But before she could even say anything, Tomohiro suddenly lunged forward and attacked her, repeatedly stabbing her with his pocket knife as he yelled, die, die, die. The phone call with the police was actually still going on this entire time, and you would think that the police would probably try and quickly track her cell phone so that they can find out her location, right? But no, the police just assumed that she was home and sent officers to her home address instead. Luckily, about two minutes into the attack, several passerbys heard Mayu's screams and phoned the police. By the time the police actually arrived at the correct location, Mayu had already been stabbed a total of 61 times. She had stab wounds all across her body, including her eyes, her chest, her neck. I mean, the injuries were just absolutely brutal. She was quickly rushed to hospital where she fell into a coma and even suffered a heart attack. Meanwhile, Tomohiro, who was still at the crime scene, was immediately arrested. During his questioning, Tomohiro expressed absolutely no remorse. He pled guilty to the attempted murder, but said that he didn't feel like he owed Mayu an apology. He claimed that Mayu was the one who caused him to lose his temper by not providing a proper answer as to why she returned his gifts. Even now, after everything that he had done, Tomohiro still felt like he was the victim in this situation, and he even proudly admitted that he had intended to kill Mayu that day. Thankfully though, it turns out he didn't succeed, because after being in coma for almost two weeks, Mayu miraculously regained consciousness. It turns out the stab wounds had somehow missed her vital organs. But of course, that didn't mean that she escaped the attack unscathed. She was left with severe facial scarring, partial paralysis, and visual impairment, and had to go through months of reconstructive surgery and physiotherapy. But despite all her injuries, Mayu was determined to seek justice, and so she bravely assisted with the investigations and even agreed to speak at Tomohiro's sentencing. The sentencing hearing finally began in February of 2017, and just as she had promised, Mayu prepared and read her victim impact statement. According to reporters in the courtroom, Tomohiro was seen laughing and snickering the entire time, and at one point, he even yelled at Mayu. But despite his complete lack of remorse and the severity of the crime, Tomohiro was only sentenced to 14 and a half years in prison. His short sentence shocked the nation and caused a ton of of public outrage, with many Japanese people criticizing the government and police for their lax attitude towards stalking. In 2019, Mayu herself ended up suing the Tokyo Metropolitan Government for their negligence and inaction. During her lawsuit, she highlighted how there were many other victims of stalking that had similarly been ignored by authorities, and she hoped that her case would cause the police to re-evaluate their attitude towards stalking, particularly when it came to online harassment. The entire incident finally prompted the Japanese government to revise their anti-stalking laws, and the definition of stalking has since been expanded to include all forms of online harassment. The police also formally apologized to Mayu for the handling of the situation, but of course, this apology is too little too late. 
Even today, six years after the attack, Mayu still has to deal with the long-term effects of her injuries. Recent photos of her arms still show that she has many scars, and she's also unable to eat or sing properly and doesn't have full control of her fingers, leaving her unable to play her favorite instrument, the guitar. Not to mention, the attack also affected her mentally, causing her to develop insomnia and PTSD. It's honestly really sad because Mayu was only 21 years old at the time of the attack. She had just started pursuing her goals of becoming a singer, and she still had her entire career ahead of her, only for Tomohiro to just completely rob her of all those hopes and dreams. Even though Tomohiro is currently in prison, Mayu has also expressed that she's really worried about what would happen after he gets released. He only has about 9 years of his sentence left at this point, and considering his history, many people believe that he might just continue terrorizing Mayu after his release, or possibly even target another female celebrity. I mean, if you think about it, stalkers like Tomohiro become stalkers in the first place because they already have an obsessive and delusional personality and I really doubt that throwing them in jail for a few years is going to suddenly cure them of all those tendencies. In my opinion, more needs to be done after the jail sentence to actually continue monitoring these stalkers, and I'd imagine that some sort of mandatory rehabilitation program, or possibly even a stalker registry, might be more useful in actually reforming these stalkers and keeping victims safe long term. But of course, these are just my opinions, and I myself have thankfully never been in this situation before. But if any of you guys have actually been victims of stalking, then I'm really interested to know what you guys think of this issue. Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments. And yeah, that concludes the terrifying story of the J-pop idol stalker, Tomohiro Iwazaki. If you found this video informative, then I'd really appreciate it if you could give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Also, be sure to check out my Patreon where I do more chill videos and I also upload all my research documents. And last but not least, if you have any other suggestions for topics you'd like me to cover, then be sure to suggest them in the comments. And I'll see you guys in my next video. Bye!